Um, so before we get started, I, I think it was a, was it a 70-30 split? Startup versus slightly bigger company? Was that the split? Or was it the other way? So 30 startup? 70 startup, okay. How many of you are focused on like pure play consumer apps? Anything to do with consumer? C to C, okay. Uh, how many uh, building or selling to enterprise? Okay. And I thought I'd see a lot of, well, I, I thought I'd see a lot of consumer after the snap deal announcement, but it's good to see, it's good to see enterprise here. Too much work for consumer. Um, so, so here's what I wanted to spend some time on, on today. By way of my background, as, as Pallavi is saying, and, and uh, she's being uh, a lot more sort of uh, open in terms of my achievements than what I've really done. But the, the things I wanted to call out were that um, I started my career with an enterprise software company called MicroStrategy, which some of you may know of there in the business intelligence space. Uh, did that for about five years in the US, um, and they were really young, 30, 40 people. We grew to about 1,800, 2,000 people, um, all, in, all in the US, focused on the US market. Um, I stepped out and did a startup in the health healthcare space. It's sort of both focused on the enterprise side of healthcare, you know, employers, health plans, hospital systems in the US, as well as the consumer side of healthcare. Um, and that was sort of the, I'd say, the first foray from what I'd call a shrink wrap software model, which is what we typically did at, at MicroStrategy, to more of what we were calling an application service provider model. Has anyone heard the term ASP? People know what ASP is? Okay. So, you know, we had the, uh, you know, I'm going to install, sort of put the disk into the, into the computer and install software to one, or I'm actually going to run it from maybe one computer, call it, quote, unquote, a cloud, to something that may, you know, get more into a large, uh, full-fledged data center. And then it started, you know, the space itself started moving to what's being called, or what was being called as software as a service, right? So SaaS. And now, of course, the, the greatest and latest buzzword is, is the cloud. So you want to be, anything to do with the cloud is a good thing. Um, so I did, my, I did the startup for about eight years, and then uh, that was again in the U.S., catering to the U.S. market, to some extent uh, emerging markets. And then the last four years, uh, four and a half years, I've been with Yahoo, uh, focused on our um, consumer platform offerings, um, focused on large data, big data. Uh, Hadoop is a big area of focus for us at, at Yahoo, as, um, as some of you know. Uh, Cloud-based uh, deployments for all of our uh, global offerings, some in our part of the world. So that's sort of my background. And, and what I wanted to sort of give you a, a flavor of today was, was really to touch on three stories. Okay? And, and there'll be a lot of Q&A coming up, so, so get up here. So the first story is about a company uh, that's in this business called Splunking. You guys know what, what this company is? Anyone? SD is, uh, SD is not going to say that. Anyone? What, what's this company? No, Shaker is not going to say it either. OK, so, so hold on to your horses for just a minute. So this company started about 10 years ago. And you know, as, you can, as you can tell, they're in the business of trying to find needles in the haystack. Um, they're one of the largest companies in the world at the infrastructure level today. And what really stands out about them is how they got started. OK, so it's two founders. They spent about two years talking to prospective customers, okay? Literally two years. They just went out there. They spent a lot of time talking to customers, trying to really understand what their pain points are. Um, and what they came about was they said, you know, there's this sort of real need within the infrastructure layer of how companies are capturing log data. And they're having a really hard time analyzing that log data, okay? It's a lot of manual process. It's a lot of looking at like CSV files and, and so on. No real even like you know, forget, forget like big data, no real, uh, real even sort of standardized database structures in place to analyze that information. They said, you know, maybe there's a value prop here for us to really go after this space. The other interesting thing that they did when they actually got the company started was they made it so simple for any person out there to be able to download their software, essentially access their APIs off of the cloud, that, you know, even though it's typically an enterprise software sale today, the sale is driven by employees within the company, right? So think of a company like Amex, right? Any, any large company where an employee would pick up their eval version, play around with it, you know, apply it to their log file data. Um, and, and the core value prop here is I'm not just looking at, you know, one set of servers in one location, right? So I may be sort of, you know, distributed colos around the world. I've got like, let's say, nine, 10 different data centers, uh, servers within, sitting within those data centers. 
I want to really see what's happening in terms of the data that's being captured, right? Log data. And the beauty of their model was that their, the employees within these companies really became the vehicle for the sales process, right? So you typically, if, you, if you're familiar with enterprise software sales, they typically tend to be long, right? Six, nine, 12 month sales, you're selling to the CIO, you're selling to the VP of IT, maybe you're selling sometimes to the business unit, right? VP of marketing, VP of CRM. Um, but the beauty of this model was, you know, if you've got not just like, let's say 10 employees or 100 employees, you've got like 500 employees, you've got 1,000 employees within a large company using your cloud-based software, Imagine going to the CIO of that company as a sales guy and saying, dude, guess what? I've got 1,000 people within your company using my software today. Do you want to buy it? Do you want to get a good deal out of this? And compare that to Oracle, SAP, you know, you name it, right? Large enterprise software deals that typically take 12-month, 24-month deals. And sales guys are out there, you know, trying to knock on the doors of these guys, trying to make a sale happen. That's the beauty of the cloud. Okay, so the first key message of the cloud is that you really want to take advantage of your employees as your trailblazers within the company itself. And, and there are some key value props here, right? You got to first focus on ease of use. Um, I cannot say enough about the jump that I made from the enterprise software world to the consumer internet world in terms of the kinds of, sorry for the term, crappy applications that we still see in enterprise software, right? I mean, SD mentioned a bunch of examples, as did Amit, about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis on our Android phones and our iPhones, compare that to what we use within the enterprise. Slowly starting to change, and in fact, you're seeing a lot of the employees themselves becoming the vehicles for that change, but you've got to really focus on how do I make it easy as opposed to complicated? How do I make it you know, feature-based in terms of what are the top one, two, three things I do? I mean, I look at enterprise software systems even today where I've got like a laundry list of 500 features. Do you even know who uses those features? Probably we don't know. I mean, forget the fact that the software company doesn't know, you know, the consumer of this software is probably like ignoring or essentially checking out of like most of those features, right? So with the cloud, you have the advantage of being able to pick and choose, you know, what you can deploy you know, through some kind of endpoint or a service, right? You've got a set of APIs that you can deploy. And more importantly, to Amit's point, you can measure, right? Literally measure sometimes near real time of what's being used. You know, what are the requests per second of that API? Um, what are the latencies, right? I mean, you've got some core platform metrics that you care about that you can really start to measure off of this. And the third most important thing is it's got to be self-serve, right? Think Amazon Web Services. I don't need even a 10-page help guide to use Amazon Web Services today, right? I can just go through a one, two, three step click. I can go into their sandbox, I can play around with it, and then I can decide if I want to sort of pony up and start paying a lot more, right? So you got to think about your cloud offering in such a way that the punchline being here that look at your employee within an organization and sort of drive what I call, you know, developer citizenry, right? Think of your developers as first class citizens. I mean, gone are the days when, you know, these guys are sitting sort of in some you know, basement room in some large company, and they're being told, look, go use this piece of software, right? Gone are those days. I mean, with the cloud, you have the advantage of really taking advantage of developers at large organizations and making them the champions, right? Because that helps you sell your offering in a better way. So that's the first story. Um, we've talked about this a little bit, so this is not new to all of you guys. But, but the message here on, on the second story is that um, if you think of, you know, sort of the key point that, that YSD was making, which is you've got this unique combo of a mobile cloud offering right now, right? I mean, it's typically seen more in the consumer space today, uh, but you're also starting to see some of that within the enterprise. You know, you've got like supply chain companies that are arming their, their drivers, right, who are driving these 18-wheeler 18 18 trucks with the right kinds of apps, right? Location-based apps, you know, being able to make sure that, you know, they essentially know where the truck is, what is the, if you will, time between the expected delivery and, and where the entire fleet of my offering is and so on? How do I drive that, right? I mean, it's a classic within the enterprise, mobile sort of really nice nifty mobile app on the front end and a cloud-based, you know, scalable back end, right? So, and you're trying to bring the two together. And if you can disrupt the taxi market the way it's happening in the U.S., I mean, I, for the life of me, wouldn't have thought that, you know, a company like an Uber or a Lyft or an Ola or a taxi for sure, or you name, the, you name the companies, would be able to disrupt this kind of market, right? Like highly entrenched, 
Um, a lot of, uh, if you will, politics that comes into it. I don't know if you've tracked Uber recently, but they're you know, doing a lot of lobbying on the government front because you've got entrenched you know, sort of um, uh, associations in New York and San Francisco and Chicago and all of these places who are really looking at this for the first time as something that will really mess up their business. Right? I mean, you, you look at the stock price of the Medallion uh, financial company. This is the company that actually sells what are called, these are medallions or taxi licenses in the US. And for the first time over the last 10 years, their stock price has started to tank. Pretty amazing. I mean, you wouldn't have thought about this even like two, three years ago. And, and really, the message here is that um, you want to start looking at the cloud as something that's an, an integral or core part of what you do as a company. Right? You've got to live it. You've got to breathe it. You've got to love it. Um, use third-party systems for running your business, third-party cloud systems, email systems, HR systems, financial systems. Um, how many of you have heard of this company called Conquer? Anyone know who Conquer Software is? What, what's the, uh, what, what's like great about Conquer? Anyone? Who, who bought Who bought Conquer? Uh, for how much? Eight billion. And do you know what, what offering they have for the enterprise? Expense, right? They're doing expense, yeah, corporate expense management. Yeah. We, I would think for the life of me that a company that does corporate expenses, right, for the enterprise, entirely cloud-based, um, would get bought up by a company like SAP whose core business is to sell, sell enterprise software, okay? I mean, they are being forced to essentially sort of let go of their cash cow, which is I'm selling, you know, ABAP, for folks who, who know what SAP does, ABAP software into a large enterprise and embracing a cloud approach which goes against their core business. I mean, the cash cow for them is still, you know, selling shrink wrap software. So if they had to go buy a company like Conquer, which is doing, you know, expense management for corporate, that tells you where the space is going, right? And that's just sort of one example of saying that um, as a smaller company or even a startup, if you're not living and breathing what's happening in the cloud, you're going to miss the boat because this, this sort of train is running so fast that you've got to have every one of your employees sort of thinking through it day and night, right? I mean, it can't be that I'm going to go invest in, you know, enterprise um, Outlook license, uh, no offense, uh, SD, and I'm going to, you know, install an Outlook license within my enterprise. I'm going to go invest in, you know, let's say a PeopleSoft HR system within, uh, within my four walls, and I'm running a cloud-based product, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, if you're doing cloud, do cloud all the way. I mean, it cannot be sort of one, sort of one, one step here, another step there. Um, we've talked about bucket testing a lot, and, you know, the one thing I'd throw out there on bucket testing is that I think if it's important in consumer internet, it's probably 10 times more important on the cloud. Think of, you know, I think it was Amit who put up the slide of um, the transition that we're going, or maybe it was yesterday, the transition that we're going in terms of the dev cycle, right? Um, when I did my startup, our dev cycles on the SaaS model was two months, three months, and that was okay. Um, at Yahoo, I mean, we've got like, you know, sometimes daily releases and, you know, releases every two days, every week. And these are not on consumer internet products, by the way. These are not mobile apps like Yahoo Weather or others. This is, you know, changing a foundation layer in the cloud, or maybe changing, you know, some piece of Hadoop code that's going to impact how Yahoo runs its business, right? So we're talking about a core infra play or a platform play where typically these cycles are longer than a, than a consumer uh, app dev cycle, but that's what the market is demanding, right? You want to be so nimble that you can quickly learn what's happening, and the only way you can do that is you've got a bucket. I mean, you've got to have a set of metrics that tells you, you know, what's in the control group, what's not in the control group, what's working well, and you know, you heard sort of very clearly about what those right set of metrics are. You've got to have the right set of metrics in place that you're tracking very frequently. Um, and then the last, of course, is the minimum viable set of features, which I already talked about. I still see, you know, platform products that say, I'm going to have a list of 30 features that I bring to market. You don't have to. I mean, you've got a cloud. The beauty of the cloud is, um, if you look at Dropbox, right? I mean, that, that Dropbox interface is unbelievable, right? That's such a simple interface where I can upload and download and share files. But a lot of the complexity is, is in the infrastructure layer, right? I mean, he's touching um, every single file format, you know, every single operating system, and abstracting all of that complexity from the user. I mean, that's the beauty of having a cloud offering where you make it so simple on the front end, but the back end can take care of, you know, the complexity that you need to deal with. Um, and then real quickly, the third story, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the story part of it, but if folks haven't seen Moneyball, you've got to go watch this movie. Um, 
Moneyball is, in a, in, in a single line, all about am I using the right metric to go up against a heavy hitting competitor, right? And the example here is of the uh, Oakland Athletics team, a baseball team in the US that had a you know, really sort of small revenue cap and they went up against the New York Yankees and they did extremely well. And the same thing was applied by KKR. So when KKR, KKR built up their team, you know, that of course the core set of Yusuf Patan and Gautam Gambhir and, and so on, but the remaining like 10, 15, 20 players that they bought was essentially off of the money ball approach, which is am I looking at the right set of stats which really matter for me to run my business as opposed to what everyone out there in the world is using, right? Which is what is happening within the IPL. Um, and the same applies to, to cloud metrics as well. So if you look at, you know, what I call, you know, what was happening in the enterprise software world, right? All we cared about were bookings, right? A sales guy goes and sells, and he says, have I made an enterprise software sale after a 12-month sales cycle? How much money am I getting for it? I'll, I'll tack on some consulting, right? Systems integration, and I'll have a maintenance contract with my customer. In 18 months, uh, you know, 18% per year maintenance, 20% per year maintenance. And, you know, this is the model that I've typically been using in enterprise software. It sort of, you know, went to the next gen, which was essentially the first gen cloud, ASP and SaaS offerings and so on, where it wasn't very different from booking, right? So you went to a total contract value, annual contract value model and so on. And all this means is, you know, over a year or a two year window, I'm looking at how much I'm making from a contractual perspective with this customer. Doesn't really work in the cloud because what you should be caring about in the cloud is number one, am I tracking things a lot more frequently because it's much easier for my customer to essentially drop me and go to my competitor, right? I mean, I can just switch off the APIs and I go to a competitor B. Second, what are my recurring revenues, right? I mean, not things that are happening one month today but not happening three months from today. Is it happening every single month? And the third most important thing is, is it committed, right? So the thing I really care about in this metric, which is, you know, if you sort of flip it, it's the cumulative, or, or sorry, the committed monthly recurring revenue, CMRR, is the one metric I'd call out for cloud companies. And if you see successful companies out there, cloud companies, this is the one key metric that they're using because it tells them, you know, or gives them a snapshot of on a, on a monthly basis, how much money is coming in the door what are the new, or new customers that are committed, but you know, they are not paying yet, right? You know, I'm still implementing the software for them. Less the churn that's happening, right? Less the companies that are not gonna use my software. That's the key metric that I care about. And your entire business, not just the revenue side, in terms of your expenses, the way you bring in talent, all of those uh, sort of key aspects of your business should be conditioned on this. And there are some other metrics that build off of that. You know, you've got a customer churn metric, a customer renewal metric, you heard about lifetime value as well. But if you look at the cloud uh, sort of business plan and how you would put it in front of, you know, let's say your board or your VCs or what have you, these are some of the key metrics that you should be thinking about because that shows a, a clear sense of the health of your business. Um, greatly performing cloud companies have CMRRs that are upwards of like 100, 100%, 100, 110% or so uh, churn churn on the recovering re revenue should be about like single digits, teens, six, seven percent max. And it takes some time to get there because you, you gotta really work all parts of your business out. Um, and we, I'll be more than happy to spend a little more time outside with you guys if you have any questions on this. Um, but those are the key takeaways as you look at um, a cloud play. Any, do we have time for questions or should we stop? Um, I think people Lunch. are hungry by now. Lunch is coming. Yes. So if you have questions, they are around. I'm sorry? Uh, it's all on the website. All, I'm sorry, I should have put it up here, but I, I don't think I have it. Um, is it on the? Uh, it's on the website. OK, NPC if you want website. the email address, it's, it's my last name, first name at yahoo.com. One word. Okay. Just search for me on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook. Thank you very much, Sudhir. Thank you.